I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. What a blessing it is to be with you again this month. This is our third month in which we have gathered here to have our worship service in the Sassoon Fairfield, Vacaville area, Solano County, if you will. And we are truly blessed to have you. If you're here for the first time, welcome on behalf of Christ Bible Church. Our meeting here once a month is a missionary outreach of Christ Bible Church in Pleasanton. And so we do have some of our members here from Christ Bible Church in support of this work, this outreach of our church. We seek to bring the gospel to Solano County. <clears throat> we have been witness, we have been ministering to a number of our church members and others who live in the Fairfield area for over 30 years. And <clears throat> by God's grace, we are expanding our outreach, uh, going door to door, uh, putting door hanger bags on the knobs and with uh, invitations to this service. So we are truly honored to be able to reach out with the gospel to uh, this area. We also include two gospel tracks in that doorknob bag. So we are blessed to have you with us today and to bring the gospel to this particular area. <clears throat> if you have a Bible, I'd like you to turn to Romans chapter 13, the chapter that Brother George just read. If you're not there already, <clears throat> please turn there. I have a special message I want to share with you. It's one that's close to my heart, one that I have been very burdened about, very concerned about over the last couple of years in particular. In the chapter that George read, there are three verses the last three verses of chapter 13 that I want to talk about this afternoon. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and read them again in the New King James Version and then also in the New International Reader's Edition. <clears throat> First, Romans 13, 11 through 14 in the New King James. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us there, let, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, <clears throat> pardon me, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. And now with a little bit more clarity for some, the New International Reader's Edition. When you do those things, keep in mind the times we are living in. The hour has come for you to wake up from your sleep. Our full salvation is closer now than it was when we first believed in Christ. The dark night of evil is nearly over. The day of Christ's return is almost here. So let us get rid of the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us act as we should, like people living in the daytime, having nothing to do with wild parties. Don't get drunk. 
Don't take part in sexual sins or evil conduct. Don't fight with each other. Don't be jealous of anyone. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ as your clothing. Don't think about how to satisfy what your sinful nature wants. For a brief word of the context, the book of Romans is basically divided into two parts. The first 11 chapters are doctrinal, with teachings built systematically from one doctrine to the other, leading up to the future of Israel and also our glorification as believers. And then beginning at chapter 12, verse 1, through the end of chapter 16, the end of the book, we have miscellaneous practical instructions. Within this list of practical instructions, we find our text in chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Basically, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is burdened for a sense of urgency among the believers to live holy lives and to walk with purity and holiness and sharing the gospel. In other words, walking faithfully as light and salt in the world. The Apostle Paul is concerned for the believers that they would not live and walk in darkness, that is committing sin, being hypocritical, being lukewarm, complacent, and double-minded. He wants the believers, that is those who are truly saved, to act like it. He wants them not to live in the shadows of sin, being controlled by secret sin, and laying down their bodies on the idolatrous altar of sexual sin. He wants believers to live, as it were, in the day, where people during the daytime don't go to wild parties. They don't live in the secret places like in the nighttime where people gather together and commit all kinds of evil things. He tells us to live during the day because another metaphor of night is far spent. The evil world of nighttime is almost gone. That is, Jesus is almost here. His coming is very soon. Therefore, you don't want to be caught walking in the nighttime, that is, living in sin when he comes. We are to do everything we can to be ready for his coming so that we can have confidence before him at his coming and not be ashamed when he descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. We don't want him to come as a thief in the night for us where we are shocked and regretful at his coming. We want to be ready. We want to be able to rejoice when we hear that trumpet sound instead of our hearts being gripped with fear at the sound of that trumpet, we want to be able to rejoice from the core of our being, from the bottom of our heart, and have no hesitation, no reservation whatsoever to open our arms and say, even so come, Lord Jesus. And so the title of this message is An Emergency for Urgency. <clears throat> Pardon me. And that's exactly the truth. In the churches today, which our text talks about, it's high time to wake out of sleep. Many churches are asleep. Many believers are not ready for the second coming of Christ. If he came, they would be embarrassed. They would put up their hand and say, Lord, give me an hour. Give me another day. Preferably, give me another week to repent of my double life and give me time to get back to where I need to be spiritually. But that's not going to happen. We will be where we will be when the Lord comes at his second coming. There was a family of seven people eating dinner when the roof of their house suddenly caught fire. And they didn't know that their lives were in danger because they were inside the house eating. 
and the roof was on fire. There was smoke. The neighbors came out of their homes and were watching the house burn, and they were concerned for the people inside. And there was a neighbor who happened to be one of them outside, but and he was a man that was long-winded, and he was trying to yell and get their attention and tell them to get out of the house. He was trying to warn them, but he was too long-winded, and he was taking too long. Minute after minute was going by, and suddenly there was another neighbor who just rushed into the house and yelled, Fire! And, and so everybody got up and ran out of the house to safety. You see, there are certain situations when only a sense of urgency and desperation and emergency will get people's attention. We need to yell fire in the church, as it were. We need to let people know there's an urgency. There are lost souls perishing and on their way to hell, and they're asleep. It's like they're on the Titanic and the ship is sinking, but the whole ship is still partying with only seconds remaining before the ship sinks and goes under the water. Instead of them jumping off the ship with life preservers, they're in there having fun and games and they only have seconds. And so the topic of urgency is one in the Bible that is profuse. It's written just about in every book. The writers of Scripture write with such a sense of urgency in the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament, in the epistles of Paul, the letters of Paul. There's a common thread of urgency in most books in the Bible where the writers of these books are warning people, are urging people to get right with God. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, but right now. When we hear the warning of God, God means for us to take heed right then and there. If he meant for us to, to respond a week from now, he'd give us the warning a week from now. But whenever we get a warning from God, it's at the moment we hear it, he wants us to respond. Because the Bible also teaches a companion doctrine along with the urgency to obey God when we hear his command. And that is, we may never have another opportunity again to repent and to obey the Lord and to get right with God, to make our life right with God. You see, the fall of man in the Garden of Eden the sin of Adam and Eve caused such a great catastrophe for them and for their posterity, for their children. And the damage was so devastating and the plight of their children and their grandchildren was so helpless and hopeless that the reconciliation of man through Jesus Christ is described in the Bible with a great sense of urgency because even if one soul dies and perishes, outside of being saved and reconciled to God, the consequences of such a tragedy are unthinkable. I can't think for one minute of a one lost soul whether it be one of my family members or otherwise, dying unsaved, being cast into hell at Judgment Day, and burning in the lake of fire forever. It is such a terrifying thought that I can dwell on that for even a few, a few moments without being horrified and without changing the subject in my thinking and without crying out to God for the fresh salvation of my children with a deep sense of urgency. And that's how you and I are to be living as Christians. The enemy of our souls is always trying to blunt and diminish this sense of urgency. He seeks to convince us that we have all the time in the world. And then our relatives start dying. And then we have regrets. And we say, why didn't I warn them? Why didn't I write them a gospel letter? Why didn't I send them an email? Why didn't I mail them a tract? Why didn't I call them on the phone? It's because I didn't keep up the same burden and sense of urgency for the salvation of their souls. Now, they don't die and go to hell as non-Christians because it's my fault. 
because I didn't warn them. I will, I will be responsible to God for why I didn't warn them. They will be responsible for their own sin. <clears throat> so when reading the Bible, one gets the impression that the fall of man has brought about a constant state of emergency in which the church of every generation needs to be warning the new generation. Each new generation, we have to start from scratch in spreading the gospel, proclaiming the gospel of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ all over again. Because the previous generation dies with the gospel information that they know. And we have to reteach it to the new generation. It doesn't happen automatically. There's no such thing as a class in public school as the gospel where teachers are required to teach the, the how a person can be saved in public school. No, the church is responsible, you and me, to impart the knowledge that we have received. You didn't learn hundreds and thousands of sermons either growing up in the church or if you didn't grow up in the church, Afterwards, when you attended church and Bible studies, you didn't learn them just to file them in your mental file cabinet. You learned them to share them with others. God gave you that knowledge for two reasons. Number one, so that you may know him more deeply, that you may have a deeper knowledge and heart relationship with him. Secondly, so that you can share it with others so that they can get saved. You absolutely must do both. And there's a daily sense of urgency for you to do that through the preaching and teaching of the gospel that stirs you up, through your memory that reminds you of the gospel witness you need to be emanating to others, and from the exhortations of other believers and the warnings and teachings of pastors and teachers in the church. God gives you the knowledge and he sends you various sources of reminder to keep sharing it, keep spreading it. If you lack the ability, the motivation, the inspiration to do it, then you have the Holy Spirit inside of you to stir you up afresh, to awaken and revive that heart knowledge, and to renew that burden for souls to go out and share the gospel with others. You also have the Lord Jesus Christ where in our text we read that we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. We have a Christ who is seated at the right hand of the Father. And every single weakness we have, every deficiency, every failure, every disappointment we, we have towards God, every sin we commit, we have a one source person who loves us and will not give up on us and will pray for us and will offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God every single time on our behalf before the Father. So we have the, the Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. We have the Holy Spirit, two members of the Godhead, two members of the Trinity themselves, committed, commissioned, and devoted to the Father to represent every single need you have as a believer. And if you're not a believer, as a sincere seeker of salvation to end up receiving what you need either to be saved or if you are saved, to do the work of the Lord in maintaining and growing in the knowledge of God on the one hand, and on the other hand, to be light and salt in this world so that others can see the gospel shining through your lifestyle, so that others can taste like salt the gospel in your character, in your communication with them, in your words to them. And we need no longer to fall asleep. He says, look, as a motivation, knowing the time in verse 11. It's high time. It's not low time. It's high time. We're very close to the second coming. We're to wake out of sleep. 
complacency is completely incompatible with Christianity. Christianity knows no definition connected with lukewarmness and laziness. There is no middle ground where we have the super Christians up here who are awake, who are diligent, who are faithful, who are urgent about communicating the gospel. And then we have this middle road Christianity where we can pick and choose. We have an option of whether or not to be faithful and diligent and sharing the gospel or not. No, no. There's only one kind of Christianity. Faithfulness, obedience, diligence, daily maintaining clean hands, a pure heart, a clear conscience. So nothing can convict us of sin, not the devil accusing us in our minds, not the devil accusing the brethren with accusations before God the Father and the Son, and not our conscience accusing us of unconfessed sin because we've been negligent in maintaining a life of piety and holiness within. Are you following me? There is a call going out, a silent call throughout the whole world to the true Christians, not the false brethren, not the so-called carnal Christians who are asleep at the helm, who are asleep while the ship is sinking. Not them, but to, to the believers who are listening, to the believers whose spirits are awake and in their hearts they're waiting for Christ. They're looking for Christ. They're observing the intensifying signs of his soon coming. They're looking, they're waiting, they're watching. They're saying, if not today, then tomorrow. And God, help me to be awake tomorrow. Is this how you feel? Has the Lord been stirring you up on this level, even ever so slightly? Has he been resurrecting the fear of God in your heart that has long been asleep? Oh, my friends, listen to what the Lord is saying to you. He wants to use you. There are reasons why you are being awakened to these issues in your life. These issues are relevant. They relate to where you live with God. You have a conscience deposited in your mind and in your heart, I don't have to tell you that. It has nothing to do with me. Why, you say? Because that conscience goes with you everywhere you go. And it reminds you of your obligation, your duty and responsibility to God himself because he has been so gracious to you. He sent forth his son. He sent his son, eternal, the eternal lamb of God, the eternal spirit of the son who took upon himself the form of a man. He became human flesh, born of a woman. He voluntarily encased himself in a human body, the God-man. He gave his throne up and came down into this sinful, wicked, evil world and walked among the most vile, wicked people, rubbed shoulders with them, came into contact with them, had to hear their profane words and observe their evil thoughts and actions. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The most cruel way somebody could be killed and punished was to be nailed to a cross with nails in their hands and in their ankles and to bleed to death and be asphyxiated and to be scorned and mocked and ridiculed, hanging there between heaven and earth as an object of ridicule. This is not just anybody. This is the precious Son of God, who the Bible says he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world did not know him. The creator became the creature. And while he was in this human body, on, on another level, in his divinity, in his deity, he was upholding all things by the word of his power. You say, how can that be? I don't know, it's a mystery. But it's true, because with God, all things are possible. Amen. He's omnipotent. Who do you think he is? Like man? 
We perceive him as logical, where he can only do one thing at one time. No! He upheld all things. He upheld the farthest reaches of the universe while he hung on the cross, dying. And God gave him to us because he loves us and sees us in our sin. He sees us being pulled back and forth like a seesaw. I'm going to, I love the sin. I don't love it. I love my sin. I don't love it. Meanwhile, we grow in misery, misery. And all the while, Christ reaches out his hands to us, seeking to deliver us from our weakness and our sins. And he says in Matthew chapter 11, come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Oh, if you're not a believer today, I plead with you with all my heart. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to pluck you out of the fire. That fire is nipping at your heels. The devil wants to kill you, destroy you, and have God himself cast you into a lake burning with brimstone that will never stop tormenting those poor souls whose shrieks and screams will never be silenced in that lake forever. He wants to drag you down with him because of his anger and his wrath and his malice against God and against man and against everything because he knows he has but a short time and he's doing as much damage as he can to the human race who have been created in God's image before he himself is cast into that lake of fire along with his demons and devils. Don't go in that way. Do what Jesus said. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his own cross daily and follow me. For what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? He that confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father in heaven. Oh, to have Christ turn to my Father on that day when I stand before him and him say to the Father, Father, this is Joe Jackowitz. He is my child. I died for him. Oh, Lord, glorify him. Give him that new body that he has been longing for. Glorify him with me and with yourself forever. To hear those words will cause a river of tears of joy. It will make my entire life worthwhile. Everything else being vanity and futility. Oh, my friends, our only hope is Christ. Christ for the lost is the Redeemer, the hope of the world. And Christ for the saved is the preserver and the keeper and the joy of the brethren. Glorify Him. Turn your life over to Him afresh. Stop being slaves of sin in your bodies. Repent of that sin. Renounce it and go to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I need to be saved. Let your justifying blood wash me. Or go to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord, I am saved. Let your sanctifying blood wash away those unconfessed sins and give me grace to be renewed in the spirit of my mind. Oh, my friends, there are thousands and thousands of people here in Sassoon, in Fairfield, in Vacaville. There's 105,000 people alone in Fairfield. I drive by the population sign on the highway all the time that don't know the gospel, most of them. If you're a believer, get your life washed and purified before the Lord. Recommit in a lifestyle of holiness through the grace of Christ, not through your strength, through the grace of Christ, and join us in reaching out to these communities. Because there's an emergency for believers to have urgency about reaching out to lost souls, people who are blind, alienated from the life of God, 
because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. They're groping about in darkness. It should cause tears to come to our eyes. Look at them, Lord. Look at them. They were pursuing vanity and sensuality and sexual immorality and drugs and alcohol and every substance that would ease their guilt. They're pursuing it with reckless abandon as if they were created to be a slave of substances from this earth when the earth was created to serve us and to use it wisely and nobly and wholesomely for the glory of God. Oh, Lord, save them. Join us. We need volunteers to go door to door. See Charles Johnson. Talk to George Tate. Reach out to your family members. Well, I'm, it's kind of awkward and I'm scared. You have, do you not have the Holy Spirit who gives love and peace and power and boldness and courage to every timid soul who is naturally introverted and shy? Oh, the Holy Spirit's an expert at making the shy transform into lions. As the Bible says, the righteous are bold as a lion in the book of Proverbs. The Holy Spirit can do amazing things with the weakest meekest people. Let's start going out there door to door and reach out. You never know that little doorknob bag with the church invitation to this service here and those two tracks, it'll fall in the hands of someone who was the night before weeping before God, crying out to God, saying, God, I'm not going to go to that boy's house anymore. I'm not going to go to that girl's house anymore. I can't do that anymore. I can't take that anymore. I can't bring that into my body anymore. Oh, God, send me somebody to help me. And you put this doorknob bag on there. And they, they get that. What's this? And they read. And scales fall from their eyes. The Holy Spirit opens their eyes and answers their prayers that they've been praying. And they realize for the first time in their life, though they've heard about Jesus, they never knew Jesus himself. <clears throat> and they lay their life down at the feet of Christ and become born again, born anew, born of the Spirit to become a new person. You were created not to be a slave of sin, but to be a servant of the Most High God. You don't have to listen to anybody who is suggesting or beckoning or propositioning or tempting you to follow them or to do what they're doing in rebellion against God. Resist the devil, the Bible says, and he will flee from you. Stand on your own two feet. And do what God tells you to do, even if you're alone in the matter. If God be for you, then who can be against you? And so there is, in the first place, a gospel urgency. An urgency. What's so urgent about the need for salvation? I mean, what, what's the big deal? Take your time. Eat, sleep, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Did you know that 200,000 people die every single day who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they go to hell? Most people are going to hell. Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and few there be that find it. But isn't there going to be an innumerable number of saints in heaven? Yes. But compared to every person who was created since Adam onward, it's a very, 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 very tiny number, that innumerable company. Many people are going to be shocked on Judgment Day witnessing just how many untold numbers are being cast into the lake of fire. It is a real lake with real 
fire. And our consciences testify that it's coming. That judgment day and its consequences and punishment for sin, it's coming. Every time your conscience says guilty for a sin, it testifies of the next life, specifically the judgment day that you will give an account to God for. That's how you know, without even knowing the Bible, without even hearing the gospel for the first time, you know that there is a judgment day coming. Your conscience bears witness of it. Those who have never heard the gospel, the good news of salvation, those who were never religious have a conscience. God put it there. The law of God written on our hearts from our inception, from our birth, or from our mother's womb. There's no second chance after we leave this world. We get one opportunity. No second chance. In the book of Luke chapter 16, turn there in your Bibles, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Please, turn there. <clears throat> Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, <coughs> desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich, rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, or hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. And he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. First of all, notice the sense of urgency that the rich man in hell has. He wasn't urgent about the next life while he was still on the earth, enjoying his many riches, taking his time, being comforted by his rich lifestyle and lifestyle of pleasures pursuing the cares of this life. There was no urgency. There was no religion. But suddenly he's in hell and he has a completely different perspective. His mind was consumed constantly by the religious situation that was going on. He saw heaven was open before him where God is. He saw Abraham there and Lazarus. He was consumed with thoughts about being relieved from the pain of hell and torment. He was concerned and burdened for his five brothers and their souls. Knowing what his soul is going through in hell and torment, he was concerned about his family. It's one thing as a Christian to be concerned about your family while you're on the earth. But it's another thing to be concerned about them in the next life when you don't have an opportunity to talk with them. Brethren, get courage and boldness from the Holy Spirit and reach out to your families 
If they don't know the Lord, each day go, that goes by is one day closer where they will end up like this rich man. When was the last time you spoke to your family member about the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? There is an urgency. And Abraham told the rich man, look, they have the gospel. They have Moses and the prophets. That is, they have the word of God. They have the good news of salvation, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, that God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. On earth, they have the gospel. If they do not hear the gospel while they're on the earth, before they die and put their trust in Jesus Christ, they will not repent and believe the one raised from the dead. Though they see many miracles, they will not repent and believe unless they hear the gospel and believe in a Jesus Christ as presented in the gospel that they've never seen before nor heard his voice before. They, by faith, must believe in a Savior who promised whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. A Savior who left his word and he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, should not go to hell, should not be tormented day and night, but have everlasting life. That is what you must hear and believe is the perfect word of God who cannot lie and believe it. Bank your life on it. Park your life on that promise and keep claiming that promise. Keep bringing it to the Lord and claim it as your own, as if you're the only one God gave it to. And believe it and keep bringing it back to Jesus and say, Lord, you gave this to me. You promised me that I would be saved if I repented of my sin and put my trust in you and gave you my life. I know that you will save me eventually. Whether it's now or an hour or a day from now or a week from now, you cannot lie. I trust your promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Oh, don't you long, if you are not converted, to be clean inside, free of guilt, Replaced with the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you long for that peace? Aren't you, try, aren't you tired of trying to temporarily fill a loss and lack of peace with the things of this world, with psychology, with substances, with relationships which only make you feel guilty and turn your body over to Satan and the flesh rather than using your body as a servant of righteousness. A servant of righteousness. Don't you want to use your intelligence, your skills, your body, your resources to glorify God and establish a track record of good works that you will be commended for by God himself, whose words will thrill your soul when he says to you on judgment day, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Oh Lord, you're telling me to enter this joy? Watch out! Here I come. Isn't that what your destiny, that you desire for your destiny? There's nothing stopping you. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who is on his throne right now. Do you not see him with the eye of faith? The son of man beckoning all of you, regardless of your need to come to him. Trust in him. Lay your whole life, its needs, its problems, its troubles, lay it at his feet and wait for him to help you and answer you. Don't turn to the world again and be disappointed for the millionth time that there's no help coming. 
What kind of person does that? What kind of irrational, illogical lunatic will keep going back to the same failed source for help when it has never helped? What a waste of time and effort. Let me give you some reasons why there's an urgency. There's no second chance after we leave this world. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. The Holy Spirit lays a burden on his people in appealing to unsaved people. This burden is normal and is accompanied by a sense of urgency. Go to the Lord in prayer, my Christian brother, my Christian sister, every day, and ask the Lord to stir up the burden for your unsaved loved ones and for unsaved people, unsaved co-workers. How can we, how can we even look at them with indifference with unconcern about their souls when we know where they're going? How can we look at them with eyes of contempt like they're beneath us? How can we look at them as if they have no soul, as if they were not created in the image of God like we were? How can we ignore them and their plight when one soul, the Bible teaches, is of such great value? It is an unspeakable tragedy when one soul goes to hell and burns there forever in order to satisfy the justice and righteous vindication of God. How can we look at them differently when once the Holy Spirit gives us the eyes of Christ through which to see them with compassion, with pity, with a sense of mercy, looking at them with the eyes of the Spirit, with our hearts dropping, with our hearts sinking, because we know they're lost and they're slaves of sin. And we see them go out the door at night. We know where they're going. And it causes us to be full of grief and sorrow, knowing they're going back to that altar to hop up on that altar of idolatry and offer up their own body as a slave of sin once again, once again. Parents who see their children go out the door knowing where their children are going ought to be broken. They ought to go in their bedroom, pull their hair out with angst and sorrow and cry to God, Lord, Put a stop sign in front of my son, my daughter. Don't let them go back. That's my flesh and blood that's laying their bodies on that altar of idolatry. Oh, Lord, have mercy on them. It's better not to have children than to have them and be slaves of sin. It increases the burden and the weight of responsibility on us as well to pray for their souls. What are we doing with our time? If we're not witnessing to them, reaching out to them, praying for them, appealing to them in love, pleading with them. The Lord says it's high time. It's high time. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. I'm going to be 70 years old in a few months. All those 50 years or so that I've been saved... I cannot get one day back to live it all over again and sharing the gospel with people. And how many days have I wasted just sitting at home, watching the world go by, watching unsaved people live their lives as slaves of unrighteousness, and I remain silent. When Jesus died on the cross to give me a life, full of knowledge and wisdom and power and courage and light and life and love to have the equipment and the supernatural ability to go out and share a gospel 
of the supernatural, a gospel of miracles, a gospel that will employ the Holy Spirit in changing others' lives so that I can't do it anyway. I just bring the message and I have the burden and I pray for them, but it's God who changes them. So God doesn't even rely on me to do the changes. He relies on me and calls me to the sacred, holy task of sharing the message that changed my life. The reality of which I share with other people. And I tell them as one urgently who says, this is what the Lord has done for me. This is what the Lord has done for me. And this is what I heard in terms of the gospel that changed me. Can you do that? Can you do it every day or almost every day? Can you pray for God to open doors for you? Can you believe him to do it? If he saved your soul and performed a miracle that only he can do by raising you from the dead spiritually, he can give you a little grace every day to share that gospel that you heard with other people. Can he not do that? Do you believe that? You see, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. It's not good for people after they die. And some of our family members have one foot in the grave already. You say, but I don't know if I get along with that person. Apologize to them. Take the blame. Put the problem on your account. Yeah. If it means you're not going to share the good news with them, write them a letter, apologize, and then a week later, after they have time to digest that apology, share the gospel with them for their own soul's sake. Humble yourself. Take the blame. Admit your part. Reconcile with people so that those people at least go to the grave and see that a true Christian if you are one, can humble himself and take the low place and then share the gospel. The greatest gift you can give them is the good news on how to be saved. It is the greatest olive branch you can use to reach out to them to say, here's the most valuable, priceless thing I have, the gospel of your salvation. Do it! Right away. Don't wait. The devil is a master teacher of people on how to procrastinate. Oh, he has the most sly, clever reasons that he plants in your mind. You think it's your thoughts? He knows how to slip in and make it appear as if, oh, that's my thoughts. Nah. Now why you should just take your time about this stuff. When the Bible, page after page, chapter after chapter, yeah. book after book, is urging you, the Lord is coming as a thief in the night. Read the Gospels alone. Jesus is warning, 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 thief in the night. He comes when you're not expecting it. We all have eternity to celebrate our victories. But we only have got like an hour, so to speak, before the sunset comes to win them, to win them over. Jesus said, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Don't procrastinate. Don't wait. Look at all the people in your lives. Could they, could they get any more unsaved than they are right now? What are you waiting for? The second coming? It's too late then. Yeah. Hebrews teaches us, therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Are you drifting away? For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression 
and every disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? What are we waiting for? What are we procrastinating for? Why are we neglecting our great calling and sacred work of evangelism, of personal evangelism, of taking the thousands of sermons and the knowledge of God and the doctrines and teachings that we have invested countless hours going to church, Bible study, reading books, reading the Bible. Why are we neglecting that and sitting on it and not using it to train? Why are we not meeting one-on-one, -on -one, discipling people who are interested in seeking the Lord? Why are we not meeting in small group Bible studies? Why are you not imparting all that knowledge? God didn't just give that knowledge to you to set it on a shelf and admire it. Oh, isn't that nice? I know this, and I know that, and I know this. My brothers, knowledge puffeth up, but love edifies. The love of God in us that takes the knowledge off the shelf and shares it with other people edifies them, informs them, helps them. This is a matter of life and death. They call it an existential issue, an issue of existence, an existential issue. It's a matter of existence, of life and death. And so we need urgency in preaching the gospel because the battle is against procrastination. Somebody came to Jesus and said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Yeah. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Mm -hmm. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Amen. What are we waiting for? Let the dead bury their dead. Your life's not going to be perfect before you're ready to preach the gospel. The Lord says, do it now. Some of you are in, are in your 70s here. You know who you are. Maybe one or two in their 80s. What are you waiting for? I'm not saying you're not. I was thrilled when Charles got up. I had a brother, I don't know if you were praying or preaching or, or you were urging us about something. And I'll tell you what, I got stirred up. That's what we need. Yeah. And he's 75, 76, 76 years old. Like Moses, he can go down to the grave with full energy in the Lord. Amen. Without your strength being abated for the Lord. There's time urgency. The Bible says, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Where it talks about today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. The word today is a reference to time. It means some, that sometimes God gives a limited response time to repent under threat of chastisement. God is loving, yes, but sometimes he wants us to respond now, not later. And we don't have all the time in the world. You over 50, look at your face in the mirror. You see gray hair on top of your head or on your face? You see wrinkles getting deeper? That's a message. That's your body clock reminding you you're getting closer to the day in which you won't have any more time to serve the Lord. That's reality. So you serve the Lord and your children serve the Lord. Don't look at everybody else and compare yourself to other people and measure yourself by them. Well, they're able to be lazy and call themselves Christians. That's them. There's not enough margin in the Christian life between being faithful and lazy to give me any slack to be lazy. Yeah. 
When the Bible is always saying, do this now, now, now. When the Bible always is always warning, now, now, now. I don't, I don't see a little margin that I have an option to slow down. And so, there is an emergency for urgency. And our Lord Jesus Christ is so <coughs> loving, compassionate, and knowledgeable about our limitations and weaknesses. If you want to go to that next level, of dedication and consecration and faithfulness to him. Not because you have an option, but because it's his command. I know it's scary, and it's perhaps for some of you a place you have never been before, but take the step of faith. If it's God's will for you, if it's his perfect will, and you know he wants you to do this because he commands it, take a step of faith and obey him, obey him, and he will make up for anything lacking in you that has been hindering you until now from doing it. Any commandment, anything, you are to use your body and your resources and all the skills God has given you to stretch your abilities even to the breaking point to obey God because God loves it when he sees a person obeying him. Amen. Obeying him even if it means it goes counter to the prevailing popular notion and acceptable behavior of people. Go against conventional wisdom. Go against the advice and the lifestyle of other people who are wicked, who don't know the Lord, who may be like worldly wise men giving worldly advice from worldly experience, but that advice is satanic. It's devilish. It's causing you to turn your life over to the enemy again and waste it. Don't. From this day forward, from this day forward, go to the Lord by faith and say, Lord, I don't know how it's going to do, be done. I'm just going to go by faith. I know I can't go back to the way I was. I can't go backwards. The Lord didn't give me no backing up shoes. I can only go forward. I can only go forward with you and I'm going to trust you for the strength and the grace yeah. to follow you. Oh, how the Lord loves that kind of faith. Yeah. He loves that kind of faith. I'm going to obey him. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to obey him. Yeah. Get some intestinal fortitude. We can show conviction. We can show determination with our former lifestyle as slaves of sin and compromise. Can't we show conviction? and determination, and moral strength when it comes to obeying God, obeying the Lord Jesus Christ, who died in my place, who bore the wrath of God for my sin in his own body on the cross, and paid my price, the price I would have had to pay. He took my punishment upon himself, and, and, and he paid a price of an, the equivalent of an eternity in a lake of fire so that I don't have to? Isn't he worth it to get some conviction and to take a stand for the Lord and go against the prevailing opinion of my children, of my family, of my friends, of those who would look down upon me, who would change their opinion of me if I said no, no, no to them, and yes, yes, Yes to God. It means you'd be storing up favor with God, commendation with God, approval with God, blessing from God. Every time you said yes to God and no to everything and everyone else, that would hold you back from now on as being a servant of righteousness. A servant of righteousness. We are Christians. We're servants of righteousness and of the Lord Jesus Christ. We follow godliness and holiness. 
Not the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world, what? Passes away. And the lust of it. But he that does the will of God, oh, abides forever. We live with God forever. We're made anew. We never get old. We never get tired. The life of God is constantly <laughs> renewed in us every second of our future eternity. And we stay young forever. And we have joy forever. It's like a nuclear combustible engine or a nuclear reactor. It can, it can live for years without being renewed. And we will live for eternity with Christ, being like Christ, for we will see him as he is. And his likeness will be reflected in us. And we will be like him. We will think like him. And we will follow him wherever he goes. Can you imagine this huge innumerable body called the church as one big entity following him? It's got to be a lot of room in heaven for us to, this one body following him. Going wherever he goes. We are a chosen people, a royal generation. A very select group of people called saints. There is nobody like a saint. Not angels, not cherubim, not seraphim, not the four living creatures with eyes all around in their head, not the four and twenty elders, not any other creature is like a saint because God only has a saving, loving, deep knowledge relationship with saints where his children, where one with him, will have his heart to the full bursting joy that will be full of bliss, and we will have this exclusive, unique relationship with him in heaven, and we will be unlike anyone else, and he has a special, redemptive, father-child love with all of them, with all of them, and only them, like no other creature of God. Don't you want to be among that company? You have to lay your life down now for Christ. Now. You say, but if I do what you're saying, I won't get the promotion that I've been looking for. I won't be friends with this whole group of people in my life right now. I'm just going to have to carve all those people out. And I'll only be able to interact with this small group of people here. Because this small group of people loves holiness. They love to talk about the Lord. They love to read the Bible. They love the things of God. Well, so be it. Because don't you realize... Your very life is at the door. Your very life, even if you're 12 years old or 6 years old in this room, your life is going to go by so quick. Just like the adults in this room. And you'll be standing before God. And when you stand before God, you don't want to be going, but, 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 but. you want to be confident that you know the Lord. And you want to be able to look in his eyes and say, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I know you. You don't want him saying to you, I never knew you. Depart from me. You want to be able to look at him and say truthfully from your heart, but Lord, you know that I love you and I knew you. Well, that, that means you're going to have to live a holy life to have that kind of knowledge renewed in you. Yeah, that means you're going to have to cut out the world from every area of your life because the world in your life diminishes the knowledge of God in every way. Choose you this day whom you will serve. If the Lord is God, then serve him. If he's not, then don't serve him. Don't straddle the fence and make things worse. By being lukewarm. Make up your mind. You either give everything to him or not. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your mercies, which are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Your compassions, they fail not. You have been so patient with every one of us in teaching us and discipling us and helping us grow and opening our hearts and eyes
to our own sins and failures and giving us grace to overcome and to get to a place of greater commitment to you. Thank you for the grace that you've brought into our lives to go deeper with you and to hear a message like this that so few would hear. Not that it's anything special, but it's normal. It's reasonable. It's our reasonable service. Lord, help each one in this room. If someone is not saved, oh God, please come down from heaven, your holy dwelling place. And break their hearts. Take away the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. A repentance not to be repented of. A godly sorrow leading to repentance. A thorough and complete repentance without regret, without going backwards. And grant them true, saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. A faith that would change their life, their heart, and their lifestyle. Never to go back to sin and become friends with sin again. Please, Lord, have mercy while there's still time. Hear our prayer. Hear our cries, Lord Jesus, as we knock on heaven's door, as we plead with you to come and save souls who are hearing this message. And then those of your people, Lord, Help us to take our eyes off of other people. Even if we're the only one in the world to say or serve you, let us be the true believer to the very end. For you've taught us it's not how you start that matters, but it's how you finish. Help us to run this race as Christians, to finish the race faithfully. Help us to have a sense of urgency in reaching out with the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.